Let's talk about heparin for a second. That's a medication that we use in the hospital, particularly in the ICU or critically ill patients all the time. The majority of patients who are in the hospital will receive heparin subcutaneously. And ever since we started doing that decades ago, uh, we basically saw a reduction in blood clots. And that's because critically ill patients and patients who are laying in bed for a prolonged period of time are at an increased risk for developing blood clot. And so by administering heparin subcutaneously, we basically are able to reduce this clot burden. The biggest concern is getting blood clots, especially DVTs or deep uh, vein thromboses in, let's say, the calf or the leg. Those uh, thrombi can migrate up into the pulmonary vessels, and then you can have something called a pulmonary embolus, which can be catastrophic for patients, cardio and pulmonary status. Because we use heparin so often, I think a lot of us forget exactly how heparin is used, and that's because we all have to memorize this complicated clotting cascade um, and try and remember all the factors that are involved in there. Um, but really, you just have to worry about two factors that heparin works on. So heparin is going to inhibit factor 2, which is thrombin, and factor 10A. And it inhibits both of these factors through the action of antithrombin. So if patients are not reacting to heparin in the way that you expect them to, they may have a deficiency in antithrombin. So antithrombin is a natural hormone that circulates in the body to basically prevent blood clotting. And heparin will basically accelerate the antithrombin and thus reducing the function of factor 2A and factor 10A. Ultimately, when you reduce the activity of 10A and 2A, you're basically reducing how much fibrin there is, and fibrin is going to be those anchors that create a strong clot formation, and so you really don't have that clot formation. Now, besides using it subcutaneously to prevent DVTs, uh, we can also use it therapeutically. When I was in medical school, I saw a lot of patients who were being what we call bridge to warfarin therapy, where they're on heparin uh, infusions, IV infusions, for a prolonged period of time until their INR reaches a certain point, and then we felt comfortable providing Coumadin. Now that there are these new anti-10A uh, coagulation medications, um, those are sort of replaced uh, warfarin, and we don't see as much bridging with heparin. However, what you might see is patients who are on anticoagulation, let's say for atrial fibrillation, who come into the hospital and may need a procedure down the line, those patients may get started on heparin infusions because those are much easier to start and stop in anticipation of a patient having a procedure or surgery to reduce the risk of bleeding while being on anticoagulation. There are two primary lab ways that we monitor the effect of heparin, and that's either going to be with a PTT or with an anti-10A assay. The PTT, or the activated partial thromboplastin time, is going to be the time that it takes for your blood to clot when certain reagents are added to it. And what we're looking at is to basically maintain that PTT time within a certain uh, therapeutic range. And based on what those numbers are, that's how we adjust the heparin infusion to make sure the patient is in that therapeutic range. And the anti-10A assay directly measures the activity of 10A in the body. This is more commonly used for low molecular weight heparin, such as Lovenox, uh, but it can give you an idea as to what the activity of the 10A level is doing in the body. Anticoagulation is no joke of a medication. Every time that we use it, we are basically balancing the risks and benefit of a patient developing a clot or bleeding out. So it's a medication not to take for granted.